on World News Tonight. Awaited talks. The G20 summit kicks off in Indonesia with priority on economic and military conflicts. Trump in trouble. A potential run for presidency hangs in the balance as a rift deepens in Republican territory over Trump's credibility. Fearful floods. Australia reels from the impact of extensive overflows which continue to ravage towns. And Battersea Beauty, an iconic London landmark, is reborn as a winter wonderland. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Leaders of the Group of 20 or G20 nations open talks on the island of Bali with a plea by host Indonesia for unity and concrete action to mend the global economy despite deep rifts over war in Ukraine. It's the Group of 20's biggest gathering since the coronavirus pandemic. Leaders from the world's top economies touch down on the island of Bali for the annual G20 summit. And Indonesia's president said that in his view, it must not fail as the world faces extraordinary challenges. No other option. Paradigm of collaboration is badly needed to save the world. We all have responsibility, not only for our people, but also for the people of the world. This year, there's plenty of geopolitical tensions and global crises up for discussion including the climate emergency, North Korea's nuclear program, and most prominently, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent global economic fallout. Despite Vladimir Putin being a no-show, Moscow will be represented by his foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. And due to rumoured discomfort at Russia's presence at the summit, it's expected that this year won't include a family photo. The Group of 20, consisting of 19 nations plus the European Union, accounts for nearly 85% of the world's economic output, 75% of world trade and makes up nearly two-thirds of the global population. The summit is due to last until Wednesday. On the sidelines of the G20 summit, U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping met for the first time since Biden took office. Although tensions over North Korea and Taiwan were evident during discussions, both leaders agreed on goodwill gestures to improve their ties. In a three-hour meeting aimed at improving ties, U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping had some tense moments over Taiwan and North Korea. The leaders of the two superpowers engaged in blunt talks on Monday in Bali, a day before the kickoff of the G20 summit, which marked their first in-person meeting since President Biden took office. President Biden said that he told his Chinese counterpart that Beijing has an obligation to talk its neighbor North Korea out of launching missiles and conducting nuclear tests and to take responsible actions. But he added it's difficult to say that China could control North Korea. I made it clear to uh, President Xi Jinping that I thought they had an obligation to attempt to make it clear to North Korea that they should not engage in long-range nuclear tests. And I made it clear as well that if they did, they, meaning North Korea, that we would have to take certain actions that would be more defensive on, on our behalf. And He said that should there be any reprisal, it would not be directed against China, but it would send a clear message to North Korea that the U.S. would defend America as well as its allies. The two leaders also clashed over Taiwan, with President Xi defining Taiwan as the first red line that should not be crossed in U.S.-China relations. But President Biden said that the U.S. policy on Taiwan has not changed. We're going to compete vigorously, but I'm not looking for conflict. I'm looking to manage this competition responsibly. And I want to make sure, make sure that every country abides by the international rules of the road. We discussed that. The one China policy, our one China policy has not changed, has not changed. We oppose unilateral change in the status quo by either side, and we're committed to maintaining the peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. But President Biden added he does not believe China would invade Taiwan. Despite tensions, both sides agreed on the need to find the right direction for improving their bilateral relationship. 
As always, I am ready to have a candid and in-depth exchange of views with Mr. Biden on issues of strategic importance in China-U.S. relations and on major global and regional issues. President Biden also stressed that there's no need for a new Cold War with China, saying that he looks forward to continuing an ongoing, open and honest dialogue to manage differences. Almost a week after the midterms and the control of the House is still not decided, while the Senate will remain narrowly controlled by Democrats, Carrie Lake, the Republican runner backed by Trump in Arizona, who repeated his false claims of election fraud, lost to Democrat Katie Hobbs in the race for governor. U.S. Democrat Katie Hobbs has defeated her Republican rival Kerry Lake in the race for governor of Arizona. It's the first time a Democrat has been elected to lead the state since 2006. Hobbs, whose Arizona Secretary of State fiercely defended the legitimacy of the 2020 presidential election, while Lake, a former TV anchor backed by Donald Trump, questioned the results. Lake's defeat is the latest blow for former President Trump, who's been blamed for Republicans' poor showing in this month's midterm elections, including their failure to take control of the U.S. Senate. The party is still expected to win back the House of Representatives from Democrats, but by a much smaller margin than predicted. Trump himself is due to make what he's teased as a big announcement later today widely expected to be the official launch of his 2024 presidential campaign. But unlike recent years, Republican politicians and voters appeared divided, with some now throwing their support to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Now, Donald Trump has been dropping hints at another presidential run with a big announcement coming on the heels of a red wave that never crashed. Former President Trump hosting a major event this weekend, the wedding of daughter Tiffany, the father walking the bride down the aisle at Mar-a-Lago. But for Trump, this may be a warm-up for a main event he has planned just 24 hours from now, the announcement about his political future. And in typical Trump fashion, he's creating a big build-up, writing on Truth Social, quote, hopefully tomorrow will turn out to be one of the most important days in the history of our country. For months, the former president repeatedly signaling another White House run. I'm going to be making a very big announcement on Tuesday. But now his former VP and most loyal ally stealing the spotlight, Mike Pence, speaking out against his former boss ahead of the Tuesday release of his new book, asked about the January 6th riots when Pence was trapped, preparing to uphold his constitutional duty to ratify Biden's election win. Pence also writing a scathing op-ed in The Wall Street Journal, recalling their tense phone conversation that day. The president laid into me. You'll go down as a wimp, he said. If you do that, I made a big mistake five years ago. Pence, one of several now, eyeing a potential GOP challenge to Trump for 2024. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis also flirting with presidential ambitions after cruising to an easy re-election win for governor of Florida. With those disappointing midterm results, the GOP split on whether Trump should run again in questioning whether his influence is still strong. Hundreds of residents in flood-ravaged Australia's southeast were rescued by helicopters and boats after rivers rose rapidly, cutting off communities and inundating homes. Emergency crews deployed more than a dozen helicopters to rescue trapped people from rooftops in the worst-hit towns in New South Wales state. Officials said more than 200 flood rescue operations were conducted in the state over the past 24 hours, while 24 emergency warnings remained. Although rains have eased and blue skies returned to many inundated areas, emergency crews warned the danger had not yet passed. New South Wales Premier Dominic Perrottet said the federal government will deploy an additional 100 defence personnel for relief efforts, adding that volunteers from New Zealand have arrived, while the state has also sought help from the United States and Singapore. More than a dozen helicopters were deployed to rescue trapped people from rooftops in the worst-hit towns in New South Wales state. Life Flight, a medical transport service, said it rescued 18 people and 14 pets from the central west region. Australia's east is in the grips of its fourth major flood crisis this year, the latest one into its third month because of a rare multi-year La Nina weather phenomenon that brings more rain. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. 
Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky made an unannounced risky visit to Kherson, the biggest prize of his troops have recaptured so far, vowing to press on until Kyiv reclaims control of all its occupied territory. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky arrived in Kherson on Monday, greeted with cheers in the newly liberated city as residents gathered to raise the Ukrainian flag. Kherson is the biggest victory Ukrainian troops have won so far, and Zelensky vowed to drive out Russia from all its occupied territory. We're ready for peace, but our peace for our country is all our country, all our territory. We respect the law and respect sovereignty of all the countries, but now we are speaking about our countries. That's why we, we are fighting against Russian aggression. Escorted by armed bodyguards, Zelensky told a gathering of soldiers that they had proved it was impossible to kill Ukraine before a silent tribute to troops who died during the offensive. Russian troops left behind a city in ruins, buildings and infrastructure destroyed and littered with landmines. The only bridge linking Kherson city to Russian-controlled territory was destroyed, according to local Ukrainian officials, by Russia. Zelensky said earlier Ukraine had already gathered evidence of at least 400 war crimes committed by Russian troops during their occupation of the area, including killings and abductions. The Russian army left behind the same savagery it did in other regions of the country it entered. Residents in and around Kherson have described killings and abductions under Russian occupation. Russia denies its troops target civilians or have committed atrocities in occupied areas. Mass burial sites have been found in other parts of Ukraine previously occupied by Russian troops, including some with civilian bodies showing signs of torture. The United Nations on Monday called for Russia to be held accountable for its invasion of Ukraine, approving a resolution recognizing that Russia is responsible for reparation in the country. In order to put a stop to the waves of illegal immigrants washing up on their shores, the United Kingdom and France have signed a new illegal immigration deal to bolster channel reinforcements. Britain and France are cracking down on illegal migrants crossing the English Channel the narrow but perilous stretch of water between the two countries. So far this year, over 40,000 people have completed the journey in small boats, 11,000 more than the whole of 2021. And the British government says more than 30,000 illegal crossing attempts from France have been prevented since the start of the year. Last month, British Interior Minister Suella Braverman described the increased arrivals as an invasion amid criticism of conditions at an overcrowded migrant processing centre. She signed a new multi-year cooperation deal with her French counterpart on Monday. Braverman said it includes a 40% increase in the number of UK-funded gendarmerie officers patrolling French beaches in the coming months. There's no single answer, there's no quick fix, there's no silver bullet. Uh, our cooperation and collaboration with the French on the Channel, uh, on the UK coastline, on the French coastline, is absolutely integral to ensuring that there is a, a robust barrier uh, preventing people disembarking from the French beaches in the first place. For the first time, British officers will be embedded in France, a move previously resisted by the French over sovereignty concerns. That means there will be British officers working on French soil, observing the work or working on the ground with French officers to uh, detect and intercept the illegal migrants as they attempt to leave France. Uh, we'll be working hand in hand in the control rooms, uh, you know, managing intelligence and working to, uh, with law enforcement. Also included is investment in surveillance technology, like drones and helicopters, and detection dog teams, as well as support for reception and removal centres in France. British ministers say Albanians are behind the surge in arrivals and often abuse modern slavery laws by claiming to be a victim of trafficking to avoid deportation. Albanians made up 42% of people travelling on small boats between May and September this year. British government figures showed that just over 11,000 Albanians arrived in those five months, compared with 815 in 2020.
Natasa Pirik Musar has made history as Slovenia's first ever female president. Upon winning the election runoff, she has got to work attempting to bridge the stripe between left and right political parties. Slovenia has elected its first female president in its history, Natasa Pirik Musar. She says she'll seek to bridge the deep left-right divide in the Alpine nation of two million people after a rigorous but respectful campaign against the conservative former foreign minister Anzi Logar. After conceding defeat, he said that he hopes Musa will carry out all the promises that she made during the campaign. While the presidency is largely ceremonial in Slovenia, the head of state is still seen as a person of authority with agenda-setting power. Musa said, I wish for Slovenia to become a state in which the elderly will be taken care of and listened to, and a state in which the young will wish to remain. I want a Slovenia in which we will understand that hard times are ahead because of climate change. The young expect us to take political responsibility and take care of our planet, so that the coming generations, our children, will live in a healthy and clean environment. Musa originally trained as a lawyer before starting a career as a journalist. She's worked not only in her native Slovenia, but also in the US with CNN and in the UK where she interned at the BBC. By the turn of the century, she joined the Slovenian Supreme Court and was later appointed as the Information Commissioner, a post she held for 10 years. She then began working as a lawyer, opening up an office in 2014. When she takes office in December, she will be the fifth post-independence leader of the country. Japan's economy unexpectedly shrank for the first time in a year in the third quarter, as global recession risks a weak yen and sharply higher import costs took a toll on household consumption and business activity. The economy of Japan has unexpectedly shrunk, no thanks to a weak yen and fears of a global recession. GDP for the three months until September slipped into reverse by 1.2% annually, according to data out Tuesday. It's the opposite of what economists forecast, a 1.1% expansion. It translates into a quarterly decline of 0.3% where it was expected to grow at about that rate. Inflation has hit Japan's currency hard. The yen is now at a 32-year low against the dollar. It's pushed up the price of everything from fuel to food and thrown cold water on Japan's recovery from the global health crisis. It's made worse by sweeping interest rate hikes and the Ukraine war. Japanese economy minister Shigeyuki Goto said monetary tightening in the West could deal a blow to Japanese households and businesses. Last month, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida put together a stimulus package of 29 trillion yen, or close to $200 billion, to dull the pain. Private consumption makes up more than half of the Japanese economy, but it grew only 0.3 of a percent in the third quarter. That was a sharp slowdown from the second quarter's 1.2 percent gain. Exports shot up, but were overtaken by hefty gains in imports, taking a bite of 0.7 percentage points out of Japan's GDP. A trial over the Tesla CEO's $56 billion pay opened with a director defending Elon Musk's compensation package against the shareholders' claims that entrepreneur misled the board into financing his dream of traveling to Mars. A week-long trial opened in Delaware on Monday with the Tesla director and a former executive defending Elon Musk's $56 billion pay package. Shareholder Richard Tornetta is suing Musk and the Tesla board, claiming the CEO and co-founder used his dominance over the board to craft the 2018 package and then duped investors into approving it. Among those who took the stand on Monday, Ira Aaron Price, who has been a Tesla director since 2007 and chaired the committee that developed the pay package. Lawyers pressed him to explain why the board did not demand that Musk dedicate himself to the company full-time. In response, Aaron Price said, quote, We never had the kind of relationship with Elon where he was punching the clock. A video clip of Musk from a previous deposition was played in court. He was asked if the board demanded he dedicate a certain amount of time to Tesla and replied, no, that would have been silly. Aaron Price said Musk and the board were focused on achieving targets, not time spent at Tesla. Tornetta wants the court to strip Musk of his pay package, arguing it should have required the CEO to work full-time at Tesla. 
he is not seeking damages for himself. Musk and Tesla's directors have denied Tornetta's claims. They say the pay package kept the entrepreneur focused on guiding Tesla through a critical period and led to a tenfold rise in its stock price. Musk is due to testify on Wednesday. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Bangladesh is grappling with its worst outbreak of dengue fever in three years. As of Sunday, more than 200 people have died from the disease this year. In just 24 hours, 860 new infections were added. A court in the Iranian capital of Tehran has issued its first death sentence linked to the recent protests in the country. The defendant was sentenced by Iran's revolutionary court for reportedly setting a government. Close COVID-19 test sites were seen in parts of Beijing as it began cutting routine community testing, days after China announced an easing of some of its heavy-handed coronavirus measures. Indonesian investigators will this week release the final report of the probe into the 2021 crash of the Sriwijaya Air flight that kills all 62 people on board. The Sriwijaya Air crash was Indonesia's third major commercial plane crash in just over six years. Amazon.com Incorporated is planning to lay off around 10,000 employees in corporate and technology roles beginning this week in what would amount to its biggest such reduction to date. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We leave you tonight with people enjoying the slippery floors of ice as London's Battersea Power Station marked the opening of an ice rink. Thank you for watching. Have a great night. <laughs>